An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. A genuine expression. A certain life. Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, few egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect. Your kind of velvet style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you. To be to the fullest. The international order that we have worked for generations to build. Ordinary men and women are too small minded to govern their own affairs. That order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all powerful sovereign. Gentlemen, be. Let me say, we can't simply destroy everything which a totalitarian government uses. So, what exactly is global citizenship? It is possible to think of a new moment of communitarianism. And it matters whether individual empowerment is tied to a vision of common advancement or not. It matters whether, not whether we're right or left, but whether we are communitarian or not, whether we believe that fundamentally societies and eventually global movements must rise or fall together. Order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. Let me say, we can't simply destroy everything which a totalitarian government uses. Hi, I'm Jay Rockefeller. I believe more than any time in my memory that we need to bind together, somehow to bind ourselves together through a sense of shared values. Order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. Let me say, we can't simply destroy everything which a totalitarian government uses. Professor Amitai Zioni is the founding father and leading voice of contemporary communitarianism. His goal is to catalyze the revitalization of national morale and preserve civil society. Consequently, he barely discusses communitarianism within its philosophical traditions. Instead, his sprawling, inconsistent, and intellectually deficient writings are pragmatic and aimed at an audience of activists and policymakers rather than intellectuals. The guru of the communitarian movement, Professor Zioni, wants to do for society what the environment environmental movement seeks to do for nature. Within his vision, people must feel they are part of something larger than themselves. They must be willing to make sacrifices for the welfare of others and society as a whole. In 2001, he was named among the top 100 American intellectuals as measured by the academic citations in Richard Posner's book, Public Intellectuals, A Study of Decline. Professor Mitai Zioni is our guest on Spotlight today. Aren't you more of a, as a secular evangelist than a policy consultant, as it were, in the process of national life. If I have to choose between those two, then I, you certainly characterize me correctly. There's not so much of a debate on the left anymore about capitalism, whether we should have it or not. There's a debate about how to have it. I think capitalism is always going to be with us because capitalism represents part of human nature. But the other part of human nature is communitarianism. There's a natural tendency of human beings, in addition to wanting to do things for themselves, they feel a great responsibility and wanting to be part of the community. And so I think the debate for the new generations, instead of capitalism or socialism, is we're going to have both, and then which proportion of each should we have in order to make this all work? It's a much more sensible debate.
So rather than the, the voluntary agent being at the center of things, which is the, the workmanship story, this anti-enlightenment anti -enlightenment story subordinates the individual to the practice, to the group, to the inherited system of norms and values. Ordinary men and women are too small-minded to govern their own affairs. That order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. Let me say, we can't simply destroy everything which a totalitarian government uses. Subordinates the individual to the practice, to the group, to the inherited system of norms and values. Is law enforcement sending a message that they'll protect our homeland at any cost? Joining us from D.C. is George Washington University Professor Amitai Etzioni and Joseph Onyx, Senior Counsel at the Constitution Project. Thanks both of you for being here. Joseph, since the September 11th, Americans have had to fight an enemy that we're not used to fighting. This is, a, this is someone who melds into society. The rules are not the same. Well, I think the rules are not the same, but the basic principles should be the same. The Pledge of Allegiance, which we've been talking about, uh, recently says, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And to me, justice for all means that everybody, even an alleged terrorist, deserves a fair trial. Amitai, do you agree? God, no. Uh, we are being attacked. We are at war. So first of all, in war, many of the rules which apply in peacetime are suspended. In this country, under the First Amendment, words of hate, no matter how odious, are not only tolerated, but protected. But after violent incidents like the Oklahoma City bombing and abortion clinic shootings, some argue that the First Amendment, which was meant to protect dissent, is instead protecting hate. So is it time then to consider limiting hate rhetoric? Or should we be fighting harder than ever to protect its right to exist? Well, joining us now from Washington, D.C. is Amitai Etzioni. He's an author of the Spirit of Community and Professor of Sociology at George Washington University. Nadine Strawson, President of the American Civil Liberties Union, and thank you both for being with us this morning. Well, Ms. Strawson, when Americans look at these incidents like Oklahoma City, like what goes on at abortion clinics, I suppose it raises the question of whether or not by protecting free speech as strongly as we do, we're not creating a safe house for hate. Kevin, it's very important to draw the distinction between protecting somebody's right to say something, including hate-filled messages, and on the other hand, agreeing that that is an appropriate thing to say. Professor Etziani, would you suggest that in some way we need to limit speech in this country? Well, we already do. Uh, there are many steps we can take uh, short of changing the law by having policies in place that we all have the same purpose. They will communicate like one person that certain forms of speech which lead to killing very directly are not uh, acceptable. So it's this idea of subordinating yourself to an, an inherited system of norms of pra and practices in which you find yourself. Ordinary men and women are too small-minded to govern their own affairs that order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. Let me say, we can't simply destroy everything which a totalitarian government uses. Here is the more uh, general point behind what I'm trying to say. I think it's unfortunate to approach these subjects in this polarized way. One side says, no, not on your life, and the other said we have to do it. I think a, conversation, a good discussion of these issues starts by recognizing, which has not been recognized, a priori, that we have two concerns, two fundamental concerns. One, we of course must protect our rights, and certainly the right to free speech, and we have compelling public interest. So any serious conversation starts by acknowledging that we have both concerns, and then start asking when yes, when A, when B. Any conversation which says, National emergency. Amitai Etzioni wants to recapture that spirit. Last night, he came to London 
to deliver a lecture on communitarianism. It's an ugly word that expresses an important idea which is ruffling political feathers on right and left on both sides of the Atlantic. And we must talk about the moral and social foundation of our society. Communitarianism starts from the view that two kinds of individualism have failed. The social rights-based individualism of the left and the free market individualism of the right. Etienne argues that both threaten to dissolve the glue that holds societies together unless we recreate the kind of civil society in which we agree on what's right and what's wrong and cooperate to apply those principles. In some ways, those ideas are familiar enough. Most people yearn for social harmony even if they disagree on how to achieve it. But Dr. Etienne has caused a stir because he goes further. He claims that communitarianism is a fully-fledged social philosophy which deserves to rank alongside and to some extent displace the liberalism of both left and right. Liberals are afraid to touch the questions of what the future of the family is going to be like. They don't like to have moral values. They shy away from that. Uh, they don't want to deal with the question of public safety and crime. Uh, they leave all, cede all these areas to the uh, to conservatives. Uh, it's our argument that you have to address these issues though in a new way. Not by imposing values, not by authoritarian answers, but the new dialogue in which all parts of the community will come together to some democratic, inclusive answers. The state do that. It's not a state business. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, a, it's a school's business. It's a church's business. It's not a government issue. It's a, societies don't change by government. Societies change when the people talk to each other about what's wrong with the environment, what's wrong with the way we treat women, and now what's wrong with our moral and civil order. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our ed education like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq everywhere like such as and I believe that they should uh, our education over here in the US should help the US um, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries so we will be able to build up our future for our Thank you very much South Carolina The last person there to introduce himself, I remember, was a tall, skinny guy with big ears and a funny name, Barack Obama. And so Barack was one of our first trainers, first people trained in neighborhood organizing in 1982, in 83 and 84. Toward the end of those two years, he came to me and he said, you know, I want to go into public life. I think I can see what can be done at the neighborhood level, but it's not enough change for me. I want to see what would happen in public life. And I said, and he said, I think I have to go to law school to do that, to get into public life, the elected official. So he said, would you write me a letter of reference? You're the only professor I know who, who would write me a letter. I think he didn't do too well in college, right? But that's okay. I am still thrilled to be introduced by this man whose vision of service uh, we celebrate today and whose life of service is an inspiration uh, to all of us. Tell us about your visit to Community Links this morning. Well, I was absolutely blown away by the dedication and the insight and the multifaceted community service this wonderful, wonderful group of people provides. And my more power to you all. Okay, thank you very much. Communitarianism is the inspiration behind one experiment in Birmingham.
St Paul's Community School takes problem children and works with them in small classes. We create an atmosphere which they describe as, as a bit like one's own family, where people, are, of course, are concerned to help each other as, as people with a long-term interest in each other's lives. Communitarianism there is undoubtedly benign. The weather St Paul's is that different from other good schools is a moot point. But across the Atlantic in Wisconsin, communitarianism has been taken much further. It uses not just encouragement, but coercion to stamp out antisocial behavior, and people are beginning to protest. Let me say, we can't simply destroy everything which a totalitarian government uses. So it's this idea of subordinating yourself to an, an inherited system of norms of pra and practices in which you find yourself. Ordinary men and women are too small-minded to govern their own affairs. That order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. This demand for consensus creates a harsh dilemma. Should it be imposed through firm rules and hence risk turning communitarianism into an authoritarian creed? Or should we rely on goodwill and exhortation, in which case communitarians may fail to achieve the idyllic society they want? The same dilemma faces the Labour Party, now that it's shifting from an ideological to an ethical view of socialism. Whether Dr. Etzioni has the right answers is a matter of debate. I was born in a military family. My father was a high-ranking officer of the Soviet Army General Staff, uh, inspector of land forces, uh, stationed outside of USSR in every quote-unquote brotherly country or liberated country of the world. Uh, I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute affiliated to Moscow State University in 1963. I started working with Novosti Press Agency, the biggest propaganda and ideological subversion organization of USSR, which is directly under KGB. Ostensibly, it's a, it's a public news agency. Novosti in Russian language means news, but there are no news. It's mainly propaganda. Uh, my first job was a translator with Economical Aid Group in India. We were building refineries and, and other industrial projects in public sector, socialist sector of India. My last job was press officer of the Soviet embassy in New Delhi. I defected in 1970, uh, came, landed in Canada, worked for several years as a producer of um, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, overseas service in, in Russian language, similar to Voice of America. Then I was teaching at uh, University of Toronto Political Science Department uh, McGill University Slavic Studies and School of Journalism Ottawa in uh, Carlton University in Ottawa. Uh, last year I uh, joined a small Russian language publishing house here in Los Angeles and now I'm a political analyst for weekly Panorama newspaper. Uh, Lumumba University language instruction was my so-called extracurricular activity, uh, which is usually given to Soviet young communists as a non-paid job to prove loyalty to the party. I was instructing students from Asia, Latin America and Africa before they entered a, an ideological indoctrination uh, uh, class. Uh, it was mainly uh, Russian language instruction after which the students usually join two-year or three-year extensive course in Marxist-Leninist ideo ideological indoctrination, plus their own sub uh, subjects of, of their choice, uh, medicine, physics, uh, chemistry, whatever. Uh, if, they, if after uh, five or six years studying, they, they are pr uh, proven to be, well, flexible, loyal, uh, cynical enough to follow the Soviet foreign policy, they are being transferred to a KGB school for, t for, the, uh, for a period of two years, after which they are being dispatched back to their native countries and become so-called sleepers, uh, uh, the word from 
originated from sleeping. For several years, they sleep in their own countries doing nothing. Sometimes they're pursuing their own careers, become lawyers, doctors, uh, teachers, um, taxi drivers, barbers. And they spring into action after many years of destabilization of their own countries as Soviet agents. Therefore, all of a sudden, you discover uh, well-established lawyers in, in a country like Nicaragua, who are, for some strange reason, are uh, bitterly against, quote-unquote, American imperialism and idealistically for Soviet uh, Marxist-Leninist imperialism. Uh, I joined Novosti Press Agency uh, before I graduated from the Oriental Studies Institute, where I studied Hindi and Urdu, two languages of Indian subcontinent. Urdu is the language of Pakistan and Hindi is the language of India. The journalistic part of my training was ordinary journalism, mass media, uh, uh, communication, theories and, and studies. Together with that, we had a very extensive training in uh, military, civil defense, intelligence and ideological subversion. So even before I graduated, I started working with Novosti Press Agency. First as a translator, interpreter, and guide with foreign delegations who were invited to USSR and who were shown all the beauties of socialism and dispatched back to their countries to explain to, uh, to their uh, uh, people how beautiful is socialism. Uh, my role was directly linked with KGB activities of, of brainwashing and psychological assessment of these guests. If they showed any sign of flexibility, which means uh, they showed that they were recruitable. Uh, I passed them over to professional KGB recruiters and from there on they were actively being involved in ideological subversion and propaganda, both in USSR and in their own countries. Now the propaganda concepts are not being developed. They, they had been developed long time ago. There's nothing basically new in the concept of, of overall propaganda uh, methods and goals. The ultimate goal, however ridiculous it may sound or primitive or simplistic, is the world domination. Many uh, uh, many experts in foreign policy would ridicule my opinion, but this is what it is. I saw it with my own eyes. I was a part of that. So, And my father was, I think I mentioned that before, he was an inspector of land forces. He traveled all over the world where the Soviet troops were stationed. So he knows perfectly well that the troops are not stationed there to collect harvest for Cubans or, or to help Afghanis to, to uh, develop the, uh, what the herds of cattle or goats. They are there for one purpose, world domination. The concepts, the immediate issues or problems are created, of course, for propaganda purposes, and they end up at, as a bumper s stickers, probably not uh, long, uh, it takes really short period of time. Unlike some other things in, in the Soviet system, uh, propaganda takes, propaganda is one of the things that they don't save money on. And um, there is a a huge apparatus of propaganda experts in USSR. Novosti Press Agency is just one of them, one of the organizations. But apart from them, that there is a Department of Agitation and Propaganda with this, within the Central Committee. There are faceless people, names of whom you will never learn. Uh, they are kind of classified. Uh, I didn't explain you the methods today because it will take us another day. The methods include such things as semantic manipulation. The words and expressions are being coined at the rate of five expressions a minute by extremely clever, educated experts. And the media outside of USSR obediently repeats this cliché. I give you just several examples, not, not to take your time, not to bore you to death. Okay, I mentioned one thing, United Nations. The expression was invented by the Soviet propaganda experts, not by Americans. We know perfectly well it's not united and it has nothing to do with nations. More than half of the delegations in the UN do not represent any nation at all. Uh, they are disunited, obviously. Uh, the United Nations had not been able to solve a single military conflict nowhere in the world. 
they provoked war, yes, they took part in wars, but they didn't prevent expansion of communism or, or they did not prevent a single war anywhere. So the true expression, the true term for United Nations could be disunited bureaucracies. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another cliché which was coined in Moscow by experts of propaganda. National Liberation Movement. It's not national because most of the leaders do, do not necessarily belong to the ethnic group which they lead, number one. Number two, they are unpatriotic and unnationalistic because they, they obey orders from a foreign country, USSR. Okay, they are trained in USSR. They are paid by the Soviet system, and they, they work in the interests of the Soviet system. Liberation. Whom they are liberating. Who is being liberated? And movement. Movement, we understand, is something which moves, unlike uh, something which is static. National liberation does not move. It's a war. If, if, you, if you call war a movement, probably. But it, it has nothing to do with uh, the concept of movement in, in American terminology means a legitimate, overt, organized, voluntary uh, movement, right? I presume your, your church or your organization is voluntary. Nobody keeps you here by force. Okay, National Liberation Movement is an army of bandits, professional bandits, which are kept, kept in, within the framework of the movement by force. If they betray, it's like in mafia, they're going to be executed. Okay, another example. <clears throat> of semantic manipulation is, uh, mm, okay, mm, free medical aid, for example. You think it's, it's an American democratic expression. No way. This, this, the, the term was coined by, by the communists long time ago at the time of Comintern. There's nothing free in this world. Everybody knows it. Least of all, medical aid. It's a very expensive thing to render medical assistance to other people. To somebody, sometime, somewhere has to pay for it. Who? Taxpayer. Okay. Obviously. There are many other things that are being coined by, by the Soviet propaganda apparatus. Unfortunately, see, if, if I call myself a genius, a genius writer, for example, Los Angeles Times would not call me that. Right? They will call me a strange, crazy Russian who calls himself a genius. Then why the hell they call liberation movements uh, liber what, what, what they call themselves? Just because they are many? Hmm? The logic is twisted. Let us not think in terms of principles and ideals, but be concerned with things as they are. For it is the consideration of what is that awakens intelligence. And the intelligence of the educator is far more important than his knowledge of a new method of education. When one follows a method, even if it has been worked out by a thoughtful and intelligent person, the method becomes very important, and the children and teachers are important only as they fit into it. One measures and classifies the child and teachers, and then proceeds to educate him according to some chart. This process of education may be convenient for the teacher, school boards, and administrators, but neither the practice of a system nor the tyranny of opinion and learning can bring about an integrated human being. A man history records as being instrumental in the creation of America's public education system. Horace Mann was an American educator who served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, part of the American Congress. Horace Mann was the key reformer of the education system at the time. In 1837, he became the head of the newly created Board of Education in Massachusetts, where he began the work that would eventually earn him the title as the father of American public education. After reading through the educational models of different countries, Mann finally hears about a particularly successful style that had been developed in Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany. The Prussian system had shown to be such a success for the government's purposes that, accompanied by a few other educators, Horace Mann travels to Germany to investigate. Upon their return to the United States, they lobbied heavily to have the Prussian model adopted. All in favor say aye! 
Interest in Prussia had also been growing in the northern half of the continent. Around this time, the Canadian superintendent of schools, Egerton Ryerson, traveled to Prussia in search of a new model of education. His journeys also included visiting Horace Mann in Massachusetts to further examine the system he would eventually adopt. George Brown, the editor of Toronto's Globe newspaper, was even quoted saying that Ryerson had successfully imported Prussian education into Ontario. During the next 30 years or so, a whole line of American dignitaries came to Germany to earn degrees. Interestingly enough, those who earned degrees in Germany came back to the United States to staff all the major universities. By 1900, all the PhDs in the United States were trained in Prussia. As the first secretary of the State Board of Education, Horace Mann promoted his new concept that the state is the father of children. He stressed that it was the responsibility of the state to ensure that education was provided for the child. A very noble idea, of course, but what exactly did he mean by that? And how did he define education? It seems like a very broad subject. It is a very broad subject. Education encompasses all of human history and all the knowledge we have gathered during that time. Not to mention, and perhaps most importantly, what we as human beings learn over our lifetime on a personal level. Horseman's 10th annual report in 1846 led to the first state law that made it mandatory for children to go to school. It was during that year that he supported the governor of Massachusetts in adopting the Prussian model of education for the entire state. How did he do that? The governor of the time, Edward Everett, as it turns out, was the very first to receive a PhD from... can you guess where? That's right, Prussia. From then on it spread very quickly. Just after Everett installed the Prussian model in the state of Massachusetts, the governor of New York set up the very same method in 12 New York schools. Horace Mann's sister, Elizabeth Peabody, of the Peabody Foundation, saw to it that right after the Civil War, the Prussian system that was then being taught in the northern states was integrated into the conquered south. By 1900, most of the compulsory schooling laws that implemented the new system had been passed. From then on, every American child grew up under the Prussian system. So what exactly was the Prussian education system that everyone thought was so amazing that it just had to be adopted throughout the free world? To give you just a bit of background, in the 18th century, the Kingdom of Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany, was among the first countries of the world to introduce free and compulsory education. After the Prussians were defeated by Napoleon in 1806, it was decided that the reason why the battle was lost was that the Prussian soldiers were thinking for themselves in the battlefield instead of following orders. To make sure that this couldn't happen again, a new eight-year system of schooling was created. This new system provided not only the skills needed for the early industrialized world, such as reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also a strict education that taught duty, discipline, respect for authority, and the ability to follow orders. Elite children destined for higher offices went on to attend private schools, while the rest of the population had no access to the secondary education. They were destined for the working class. Through this new system, the Prussian court tried to create social obedience in the citizens through indoctrination. Every individual had to become convinced at the core of their being that the king was just, his decisions were always right, and the need for obedience paramount. In truth, the entire purpose of the system was to instill loyalty to the crown and to train young men for the military and bureaucracy. To do this, it was necessary to squeeze out all independent thinking from the masses. Influencing this new system from the beginning was Prussian philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fitch. Combining John Locke's view that the children are a blank slate and Rousseau's ideas on how to write on that slate, Prussia established an educational system that was considered scientific in nature. An important part of the Prussian system was that it defined for the child what was to be learned, what was to be thought about, and how long to think about it. In order to have an efficient policy-making class and a subclass beneath it, it was believed that one had to remove the power of most people to make sense out of the available information. In other words, critical thinking had to be done away with. Now, if you're wondering why the average person doesn't know that the North American education system is based directly on the Prussian model, it might just be because its original purpose was not designed for the good of the individual, but for the good of the government. The philosophy of Johann Fitch directly influenced the creation of the Prussian model of schooling. As he is quoted saying, The schools must fashion the person, 
and fashion him in such a way that he simply cannot will otherwise than what you wish him to will. With quotes like these, you can see why his involvement is not well known. Education should aim at destroying free will, so that after pupils are thus schooled, they will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. When this technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. In 1807, in a Berlin occupied by Napoleon, Johann Fitch gave a series of famous addresses to the German nation. Fitch spoke of the superiority of German people above all others. The content of these speeches was a catalyst for the Prussian education system and German nationalism. In other earlier works, he called Why Jews they? a state within a state that would, quote, undermine the German nation. He openly expressed a desire to expel Why Jews they? from Germany. Fitch had a deep influence on the rise of the Third Reich and continues to be deemed, quote, the spiritual father of modern neo-Nazism. Which begs the question, why would the father of American education make it a law that every child spend their youth in a system created by the father of neo-Nazism? Historians reflect that one of the greatest social factors that allowed a man like Hitler to rise to power was that the German people had been bred from birth to respect authority above all else and accept it without question. Which begs another question, if the entire population of North America is raised in a system adopted from pre-Nazi Germany, what are we setting ourselves up for? All you have to do, all American mass media has to do, is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. So the next stage is destabilization. 
This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, uh, what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. Your leftists in, in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are not, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karmal with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. It's the same pattern everywhere. It's divided in, in four basic stages. Demoralization, destabilization, crisis, normalization. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. We don't need no thought control.